Hi, welcome to Meet the Author. I'm Jason Alster, and tonight we have Noreen Grice. Um, I'm gonna, she wrote the book, Everyone's Universe, Accessible Astronomy Places, and I'm going to read a review, a testimonial, by Neil deGrasse Tyson, astrophysicist and director of the Hayden Planetarium, American Museum of Natural History. When you've got all five senses and both your legs work, it's easy to miss how often society neglects those for whom this isn't true. In everyone's universe, Noreen Grice, a uniquely inspired champion of astronomy <coughs> education, has identified activities and places in America where, no matter your level of sensory or physical limitation, the universe is accessible to all as it should be. I'm going to read a little bit about the book. One of five Americans has a disability. In this innovative, enabling book, Noreen Grice explores ways to provide universal access to educational science programs, mobility access for people who use wheelchairs, low vision and tactile access for people who are blind or visually impaired, specialized environments for people with neurological disorders, including autism, assistive technology for nonverbal communication, non-hearing access for people who are deaf or hearing impaired. Noreen, welcome. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about the book, and I also want to show the, uh, the viewers, before we talk about that, that there was a nice review and write-up in one of the latest astronomy magazines. Okay? And show us that. Um, how did you get the idea to write these books? Actually, um, I've worked in the planetarium field for uh, 26 years and also in informal science education. And over the years, I've met people who um, either had a disability or were educators and wondered how to make astronomy accessible to someone with a disability. And I thought, you know, let me put that down in writing as an educator guide and disability travel guide. And I wanted to make a title that would really include everyone, and that's why I call it Everyone's Universe. And I read somewhere that you're actually the first person that did something like this? Uh, I think I'm at least one of the first, but my niche is really astronomy and space science education. It's something that I've always loved, and it's something that I love to share with others. And your first five books have touchable images. Are those books designed only for readers who are blind? Well, before we answer that question, so this is the very first book in the series, Touch the Stars, if you show the people what the idea was. Right. Um, it's in Braille. Yes, and you know, actually, this all started from kind of a, a coincidence. I had just started working at the Boston Museum of Science in 1984, and a group of students were in line for one of the planetarium shows, and I didn't know what to do. And the person I was working with, the manager, said, just help them to their seats. That's all you have to do. Mm -hmm. Well, I did that, and I started the planetarium show, and it was a pre-recorded show. Uh, at the end of the program, I wondered what these people thought of the show, so I asked them. Mm -hmm. And they told me quite honestly, in their words, it stunk. <laughs> and I felt horrible. It just, I, it I just, I felt horrible because... It wasn't accessible. It was images projected on a curved dome ceiling, and the show wasn't even very descriptive. It was like, over here is the Big Dipper, and over there is Saturn. And so it, you saw a need. Well, I, I open saw that a need. up, and let's see what that looks like. Right. I saw a need, no, and, it up. It up. and I didn't really know what to do or how to make things accessible, but I started working with um, visitors who here. were um, blind or visually impaired, and my very first book, which came out in 1990, is Touch the Stars. This is the fourth edition of that book. And you see it's in Braille, and you have actual um, physical, touchable pictures. Yeah, they're embossed pictures so embossed that you pictures. can touch them. The thing about this book is the pictures are raised line drawings. For example, this is Jupiter with the great red spot, and it says in Braille, uh, Jupiter and great red spot storm. So my first idea was I, I need to make astronomy and space science accessible to people who couldn't see. But that led to a series of other books. And what I like here, though, is that this is for a parent and a teacher and a person who's blind because you have the written word as well as the Braille. 
So let's move on to the. This was your first book, right? Yes, that's the fourth edition of it. The fourth edition. Is it still for sale? It is. It's sold by National Braille Press. Okay. We can put that on the side. Put that down. Um, then your next book is Touch the Sun. Beautiful cover. We're oh. progressing. Well, this We're one, learning more and more. Yes, Just this one. one. Yeah, the, actually, the, the very next one in Touch the series the is Touch the Universe. And this one uh, came about because a professor from DePaul University saw Touch the Stars in a gift shop in Chicago mm -hmm. and said, it's too bad there isn't something like that for the Hubble Space Telescope. And then we thought, why not? So we mm -hmm. started working on it. And what's different about this book is the pictures are in color and there's also a texture to them. So all the text pages have yeah. braille and print, but now the pictures are in color. So you can actually feel what the telescope feels like. Right. Very nice. Right. Okay. And then that led to... That led, how did that lead to the next one? Well, then I got an email from a solar <laughs> scientist and that's said, cute. can you do something about that for the sun? Oh, and that cute. led to Touch the Sun, that's a NASA precious. Braille book. So this is the second um, NASA book. Now, this book... The pictures someone are. Someone said this book was hot. That's right. This book <laughs> is hot. <laughs> um, so again, the the text pages are with braille and print, and the the pictures are actually silk screened onto plastic and embossed in vivid color. So it's get you're moving up over here. I'm trying it. I'm trying a different it has technique. Has very nice texture and feel to it. Very nice. Yes, and this book is still available on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Well, after that, I thought about. I always had an idea on how to teach the moon phases. Which was that led your idea or did you get an email too? No, this one was my idea that I've had for many years. This is called the Little Moon Phase Book. Now, the Little Moon Phase Book is a simple way to learn the phases of the moon by the name of the phase, by the picture as seen through a telescope, and by the picture as seen with the naked eye view. It's all touchable, and it glows in the dark. Wow. Yeah. So Why does it glow in the dark? Well, I just thought it'd be kind of cool. Um, what I've done since Touch the Stars is my books have been more inclusive. So rather than have a book that's just for someone who is blind, I wanted to bring people together because it seemed to me that, you know. So, so a person who is visually impaired with somebody who's not, maybe a family member, can both share in the same experience of the book right, together. Right. And Great the, idea. And the reader doesn't even have to be visually impaired. Right. You know, actually, it, I enjoy touching this myself. Right. You know, that's a good idea. Yeah. So, so instead of having a bunch of books that are, you know, the books for the blind versus the books for everyone else, I thought, why can't I make books that everyone can enjoy together? That's a fantastic idea. Yeah. Good for you. But how did you get, I mean, you said that's also silk screen, it's called? No, this one is actually an application. Um, this was How, done. Where did you get these ideas from? Well, I, I've ended up over the years uh, meeting up with different manufacturers, and we just try different things. So, this method is from Ozone Publishing in San Juan, Puerto Rico, where there's the picture is printed, and then on top of it, it's um, silk screened like an acrylic, almost like a transparent glue. And uh, did you see like another book like this previously to know to do this? I mean, I, I'll actually. Were there I, other books out there? No. Uh, well, I met the president of the company at a National Federation of the Blind convention, and she had business uh -huh. cards so that looked like this. And uh -huh. I thought... Oh, uh, so it started from a business card. It started from a business Clearly, card. that's being entrepreneurial. Yeah. Okay. And so I just thought, you know, that's kind of cool. That is cool. Yeah, you know, I actually did see business cards like that. Yeah. Okay. Now we have Touch the Invisible Sky. Oh, well, what's great about Touch the Invisible Sky is this um, explores wavelengths that are not visible to any human eye. Well, how did you get to this book now? Someone uh, wrote you an email? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> actually, you know, some scientists from NASA contacted me about working on this book. So now, so now NASA knows you exist. Yeah, well, NASA was, involved. NASA was involved with the first See two that. books. Um, this one, I worked with two other authors from Look NASA. And um, I worked on the text, and I also did all the graphic design. Now, let me give you an example of some pictures here. Uh, where the other books have an individual picture, this book has sets of pictures. For example, the sun is seen through different wavelengths, and each one of the wavelengths has that um, silkscreen application like the Little Moon Phase book. Mm -hmm. So... You know, this is kind of cool because nobody can see this. No human eyes can see this. But mm -hmm. everybody can learn together um, oh, by touching okay. the invisible sky. Right. No one can really look at the sun. 
Right. You can't. You can't see. You stare at it. Well, yeah, that's a bad idea. But even um, here's a a supernova remnant here. Mm -hmm. This is gas. Whoops. This mm -hmm. is gas in visible light, which isn't very much. But then in the infrared, that's heat. You can't see that with your eyes, mm -hmm. but detectors can, or X-ray, or combining them. Hmm. So you know, again, it's exploring the sky in different ways, and also bringing I'm people together. For somebody who has read your books, to make some very big, famous discovery because of a new way of learning. Uh, That's a possibility. Well, I have to tell you that... <laughs> Has anybody done that yet? Uh, no, but I've, I've worked with some students over the years through the National Federation of the Blind, and mm -hmm. uh, one student in particular who I met when she was 13, she came to the Touch the Sun book launch with her arms uh, full of books that I've written, wanting having me autograph them, and she's blind, and she told me when she was 13 she's going to be the first blind astronaut on Mars. And she's now, uh, I think, a junior at Virginia we're Tech. In, we're going to be in Jupiter and other well, places well, many times. Well, she's she is an astronomy physics major uh -huh. at Virginia Tech, and she's blind. And she is going to, and she promised me to take. She's going to take touch the stars wow. with her in the spaceship. So, wow, <laughs> so, that's amazing. Yeah, that's an amazing story. Now we know that we live on the Earth. We have touched the Earth. Yes, I did. Okay. Now the touch the Earth. I didn't write this one, but what I did is design the textures for the different biomes. So they had the idea from your book, and they said, let's do one for the Earth, too? Let's, yes. Could, ask me, could I help design the graphics for this Earth book? So, so this has now caught on as a learning process for other subjects, too. Oh, sure. And I think it could be for many other subjects. I think you could um, have macroscopic and microscopic sure. and things which are just not touchable. For a blind doctor? Yes, actually, there was a blind was doctor. A uh, Dr. Bulletin was a uh -huh. blind doctor in the early 1900s in Chicago. Wow. Yeah, so, and there are blind doctors. Uh, so, you know, anything's possible. Uh, where were those boards that you had? Where did they go? Oh, I put them away. Oh, all of them? Not yeah. You. I thought you were going to leave some. So you have a telescope here. Tell us about that. Oh, well, you know, one of the things people ask me, you know, what are some things that um, you can do to make astronomy more accessible? So, you know, I started out making astronomy accessible to people who are visually impaired, but then that led me to write Everyone's Universe because right on the cover of that book are different icons making astronomy accessible through mobility access, non-visual access, non-hearing access, non-verbal communication access, mm -hmm. and take a telescope. You know, you think of a big telescope up in an observatory. You have to uh, walk up a spiral staircase to peer into the telescope. But there are small telescopes, portable telescopes, like this um, Celestron Fur Scope. And this telescope would be great for somebody who has a mobility impairment. Maybe they're in a wheelchair or they just don't have the stamina to walk upstairs. Or maybe they're a family with a lot of kids. And it'd be um, cumbersome to be carrying uh, young children up the stairs. Instead, um, people could use this telescope. Um, one second, I don't understand. You developed this telescope? No, or? no, no, no. I didn't develop this telescope, but this is one of the telescopes that I recommend in everyone's I universe see. as an option for being accessible. I see. So you took that into account and you made that information available. Right. And this is, this little telescope is cute because it's it's quite light, it's quite portable, and you could take this out to a park or even in your backyard and just, you know, look up at the moon, check out the night sky. Never look at the sun with a telescope. Mm -hmm. That's a very important thing never to do. But this, this is a nice little portable telescope. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is a way to make something um, mobility mm -hmm. accessible. And you have another prop? Oh, yes. Um, okay. When people talk about learning the moon's phases, Oh, so you could learn the moon phases from a book like um, the Little Moon Phase book. But a lot of um, teachers teach the moon phases by putting on a lamp in a dark room. And then a, the lamp is on, the room is dark, and then a student would hold a styrofoam ball and move their arms so that different parts of the ball are being illuminated. Mm -hmm. That's fine if you can see it. If you can't see, how can you learn about the phases of the moon? Well... I've applied some puff paint, which is now dried on one side. There's a texture here. And let me demonstrate. Go like this. Okay. Imagine this is the new moon. Okay, it's nice and smooth. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to come on to the waxing crescent. 
Now here's the first quarter. See, half of the moon is rough. Mm -hmm. The waxing gibbous, now the full moon. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I turn it a little more. The waning gibbous, the last quarter, so half of that's smooth. The waning crescent, and you're back to the new moon. How about that? So by wow. just having somebody hold their hand up and rotating the tactile moon, then you can feel the phases of the moon. So once you take the idea of making science, and specifically in this case astronomy, accessible, then all these ideas for teaching everything come out. That's really amazing what you have done. Um, if someone wants to learn more about accessible astronomy and your work, where can they go? They can go to my website, www.youcandoastronomy.com. I like that. You can do astronomy. astronomy.com. Um, tell us a little bit more about your background in astronomy and why you got into it and what you like about it. You know, I have always loved astronomy, and I think it started when I was very young and I turned on the TV and there was Star Trek. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, I, and I thought that was great. You're and a trekkie? I, yeah, a trekker. trekker. A trekker. Um, I think I was maybe uh, four or five or something when the, the original mm -hmm. series came on. And, you know, when, when I first saw Mr. Spock, I just thought that was great. <laughs> um, you know, people from other places and being able to go in the spaceship and, you know, go past the Earth and go out of the solar system and just mm -hmm. learn all these new things. Uh, I was hooked. You know, and that got me looking up at the night sky. Um, mm -hmm. I was. I started reading all the astronomy books in the school library. I, I think I wore out the Golden Guide to Stars. I mean, mm -hmm. I just thought it was it was great. So and you know what? That's a good question because uh, people who watched the show Star Trek they always wanted to know: Is it true? Were they accurate? And I understand in that show there was a very strong movement towards accuracy. From what you saw of the star charts um, in that show, was it accurate? Or was it made up? Do you remember? Um, I think it was a little of both, but some of the star names I, re I recognized as I was learning about them, the different mm -hmm. planets they visited and the different stars. And, I mean, just think about, they had, you know, the communicator, you know, Kirk to Enterprise. Doesn't mm -hmm. that look like a cell phone now? Well, today we you have know? that. I mean, they actually made yeah. a show about that. Yeah. And they're showing the things that were predicted in Star Trek that we're actually using today in the cell phone and the Internet. Is, and the computers are definitely um, out there now. Yeah, and I hope that what comes of it is, you know, one of the things about Star Trek was peace. Uh, everybody from all different backgrounds together living in peace, and I, I just thought that was, a, you know, a really strong thing, and I, I was really attracted to that as, as a child. And uh, were you one of those people that cried when the show was uh, cut off? <laughs> I know um, I was. I was, one of, I was like one of the only times I cried in my life when they took Star Trek off the air, and I what, know a lot of other people did, and then we were happy when they made the movie. Yeah, well, you know, I had all the little models. Uh, the, I put together the little model kits came out when it went into syndication, and I had uh, I had a Mr. Spock shirt. So you really followed it. Wow. And I convinced uh, my grandmother, and she took me when I was in the fifth grade to a Star Trek convention in New York. Mm -hmm. <laughs> With all the stars, they they were all no, there. What year was that about? That was 1974, I think. So it was just when they're just starting their convention. That was like maybe the first or second one. Yeah, it was it was big. It was mm -hmm. really big. Um, and I re I remember you know m meeting all the all the stars, and I remember the mm -hmm. the room where you could buy all the books, and I had all the books, and I knew all the scripts. So then, how did you get from that into the professional astronomy? Well, you know, it was my love of astronomy that, that kept me going through um, school, and, uh, you know, I entered the science fair. In junior high school, I entered the science fair each year in astronomy, and in ninth grade, I won grand prize, and the grand prize was a family membership to the Boston Museum of Science. Very nice. And I thought, you know, I thought only a very... Beautiful Im museum, I've been there. Oh, I thought only very important people could work in the planetarium, and then mm -hmm. it was just, you know, a few years later that I started working there, and I worked there for 26 years. How did you get the job? Um, I started as a hall guard, because they said that people don't leave that planetarium for 30 years, so I got <laughs> a job as a hall guard. My job was supposed to be standing in front of the T-Rex um, Big statue, yeah, uh, that, but yeah. nobody, uh, you know, nobody uh, bothered the T Rex statue. And part of the job was taking tickets in the planetarium. And eventually, there was an opening in the planetarium. And I went in one day with my hall guard uniform, and I said, you know, I'm you here for the job. There. 
I mean, for the job, and, 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 and I got it, and it was great. It was a great time. I met a lot of people. Uh -huh. yeah. um, do you have some, ex uh, some information from emails or experiences, how this uh, additional information about how these books have changed people's lives? Do you have uh, examples? what you have heard? Um, you know, people <clears throat> over the years have emailed me that, um, you know, their kids really like it, that they really like it. Um, Has anybody gone into the field of astronomy since saw uh, the books? Yeah, I mean, I do, have a, I do have a bit of a following with the National Federation of the Blind, and I'm very active in that group. I'm a member of the Central Connecticut chapter. And every other year they have a program called the Youth Slam where they bring together uh, like 100 blind bright high school kids from around the country mm -hmm. and so in 2007 2009 and 2011 I was I was an astronomy instructor there bringing bringing kids together and getting them really excited about stem fields mm -hmm. and so um, you know several of them said they want to study astronomy and planetary science um, and do you have any projects online what are you going to do next um, well, I think I'm, I want to work with the schools and really get the idea of um, inclusive um, astronomy really going with, with a lot of schools because, you know, I think that, um, well, first of all, astronomy is, is part of the common core standards that are coming out for the schools. And I think that the um, strategies that you use to make um, science accessible to kids with disabilities are also excellent for all students because they're using um, different possibilities, different learning styles, and 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 I and I think that um, you know it'd be really nice to get more kids involved and excited about science. I think the strategies I use for kids with disabilities will will be able to be used in other ways. Um, would you like to read a section from one of the books, maybe from this one? Just read a chap, um, couple, a paragraph or so. Okay. Um, well, how about this? Um, chapter 7, Final Thoughts. Um, disabilities affect individuals and their friends and families. The Center for Disease Control, can, the Center for Disease uh, CDC estimates that about one in six children in the U.S. had a developmental disability in 2006 to 2008 ranging from mild disabilities such as speech and language impairments to serious developmental disabilities such as intellectual disabilities, cerebral palsy, and autism. Rather than apologizing or making excuses for why your star party, observatory, science museum, or planetarium is not accessible, try to anticipate the needs of a variety of participants. Do this by planning ahead for the visitor experience through a broad range of learning and experiential methods. Seeing, touching, listening, and talking are strategies to reach a variety of people. Multiple paths of inclusion can make the event accessible to everyone, regardless of any disability, and can enrich your experience as well. Very nice. Do you have any other examples of how you can make astronomy, the topic, more accessible that maybe you talk about in the book? Well, um, you know, people who uh, cannot communicate verbally... There are uh, different um, technologies now. It used to be that you had to buy a fancy electronic device, and a, a lot of people have it where you push different buttons for different words. But nowadays, there are different apps for the iPhone and iPad that people can use. You can also use your um, phone a, as a texting mm -hmm. way so you can communicate with people. Are there astronomy apps on uh, the phone? There are astronomy apps for the iPad and the iPhone, and there's also apps um, for communicating. Say somebody uh, does not speak and they're hearing impaired and they use sign language, and you don't know sign language. There's an app called iSign, and there's a little avatar. You just type in the word, and the avatar shows you how to sign it. So you can just keep breaking down barriers, and, and that's what I want to do. I want to break down break barriers down and barriers. bring people together. Right. Very good. I wish you success with that. Um, any other uh, examples, or would you like to read another? We have a couple more minutes. You can read another piece from the book or show another piece from any of the books that you want to uh, discuss with us. Well, I really encourage people who are educators or, um, you know, persons uh, or friends of persons with disabilities to consider everyone's universe because astronomy had often been considered such a visual science, Mm -hmm. And it isn't anymore. 
uh, there are there are organizations and scientists making different um, topics in astronomy accessible by hearing. For example, um, so it's a process called sonification. Imagine listening to a comet passing through the solar system mm -hmm. as music. Okay. People, people, people are creating music like that. Um, specialized environments for people with autism. Autism is more prevalent now because it's being diagnosed earlier. Mm -hmm. It used to be about one out of 150 people. Now it's one out of 88 people. So you're saying that these products are also, or information that you have in this book, is also for children with autism? Can yes. Can you give an example? Yes, um, I, I interview a friend from a, a planetarium in New Jersey in the book, and he does special planetarium programs for autism. And one of the things that family members who have um, children with autism note, the kids sometimes they you know they can't sit for very long, mm -hmm. they they need to have things moving, or they can't have loud sounds or mm -hmm. fluorescent lights, things that um, the average visitor you know isn't even aware of. So he developed a show where the doors are open in the back. If anyone needs to leave for a while, that's okay. At the beginning of the show, he tells them, this show is about the, you know, he tells them in advance what the show is about. There's soft music. There isn't any bright strobing lights, you mm -hmm. know, to, uh, to get anyone upset. And so there's small vignettes of astronomical themes. And it's, it's gone so well that the program has been extended. Oh, um, very nice. Yeah. And tell us a little bit about how you're getting the word out besides in the books. Are you giving talks, lectures? Um, what, what are your, how are you trying to do this to get the information out? Right. Uh, so I have a Facebook page, a Noreen Grice Facebook page, also a You Can Do Astronomy That's Facebook important. page. That's important. Let people know about yes, that. Yes, please, please go please on Facebook. Please like Noreen on Facebook. At, please go to You Can Do Astronomy on Facebook. That would be great. Um, so I, I post those things often. Also, um, one, one of the latest things that's happened is there are many different planetarium vendors, uh, companies that build planetariums and sell systems. And I have a partnership now with a company called Digitalis Education, and they're out of Seattle, and they make small planetariums. And starting September 1st, every time somebody buys one of their planetarium systems, they include a copy of Everyone's Universe mm. with that because they're also committed to accessibility. Mm -hmm. So I'm very excited because that's reaching a whole new group of people through the planetarium field. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can definitely see it. Uh, really, really uh, getting to many people and people jumping on the bandwagon and continuing with this idea. Uh, where have you given a lecture on this? Uh, well, actually, Recently. last year I spent a lot of time uh, speaking at, in uh, March at the CSUN. It's the um, International Convention for Persons with Disabilities, and I spoke um, last March in 2011. And then at, um, I debuted the first edition of this book at the New England Astronomy um, Forum, the NEF Forum in Suffern, New York, and then at the Middle Atlantic Planetarium Society, mm -hmm. and at the National Science um, Teachers Association. Uh, and recently I was at the International Planetarium Society Conference. Wow. So I have been, <laughs> been around. I've been making the rounds. One last question. Have you had anybody approach you from outside the country? I do get emails um, from time to time. Um, people are interested, actually, in translating the book. So I have to, I'm going to look into that. Mm -hmm. um, that. I would like to do that. But there, there's a whole group of people that are also interested in making astronomy accessible. And it's, um, they have an organization called Astronomy Without Borders. Very and nice. that's also on Facebook. So you got your work cut out for you. That's fine. That's I'm excited about it. Well, that's the end of the show, Noreen. It was a pleasure to have you as a guest. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you.